the issues a lot of the issues um, that are current and, and of concern to SGR in one way or another. So the question is, is the Ukraine war undermining UK action on climate and social justice? And there's a short answer to that question. Um, I'm going to give you a longer answer, which will go into some of the detail. And these sl slides will be um, available on the website afterwards if you want to dig in further. So. I'll start um, before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, or at least the one in February 2022, and, and look at some UK government policies um, at the height of the pandemic. And I'm going to look particularly at ones relating to military social justice and, and climate and energy. So at the height of the pandemic, um, the government announced, the Boris Johnson government, um, former government as it was at that point, <laughs> um, they announced a major increase in, in military spending, um, a major increase in nuclear weapons stockpile, 44% increase in, in the nuclear weapons stockpile, um, and an expanded set of circumstances for nuclear weapons use. And remember, this is in the middle of the pandemic, a global health emergency, and they chose to prioritize the military spending and military um, um, review of military um, force structures and, 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 um, and doctrine. Um, and meanwhile, they were saying, well, NHS workers who worked so hard over the pandemic had a, were subject to a pay freeze, other public sectors, the same thing. Um, they were saying we can't afford the, the overseas aid budget anymore, we yeah, need to cut that. And on the climate realm, they just announced um, a 10 point plan for the green industrial revolution, which sounds very grandiose, but when you looked at the detail, it, it was rather um, speculative. Um, a lot of focus on technologies that were, were, as I say, speculative, some military friendly, like nuclear technologies, um, aviation fuels, greener aviation fuels. Um, possibly, um, and the emphasis on, on things like demand side options, cheap renewables was, was either marginal or, um, or didn't work, like Green Deal, or the, the, the home energy efficiency scheme that was badly mismanaged and, and failed, um, and cheap renewables like offshore wind were not, uh, not included in this policy as well. Um, and to put some figures on this, here are some comparisons on the graph on the left is looking at the military budget, the core military budget over four years that, that was announced at, at this point, um, compared with the overseas aid budget for the same period and the budget, government budget for reducing carbon emissions. And you can see the massive discrepancy there. And the graph on the right shows you the change um, in order to bring the, this, um, the graph on the left about. So there was a, a massive increase in military spending, 20 billion, more than 20 billion over four years. Um, and, um, and this is real terms as well. So it's above inflation. And then overseas aid um, cut by a similar amount because we couldn't afford it in quotes. Um, that, that spending change took UK military spending greater than Russia's um, in 2021 during the pandemic so yeah shows you where the priorities were and and um and i think it's also useful to look at this point um in, in amongst um debates around whether um military spending needs to in nato countries needs to rise um following this 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 graph is a comparison of the level of forces conventional military forces between nato and russia um, these are these figures are ratios of different um, land, um, air, and um, sea forces, marine forces, and and personal level personnel levels, um, and you can see that NATO has superiority in every realm and overwhelmingly in in most realms, um, and the combined military budgets of NATO are about seventeen times Russia, and and this was before the war. Um, and now with Russian forces depleted during the war, you can see that this, these figures are going to grow and grow, whilst um, NATO's military budgets are, are, are climbing. And the only area where there's some sort of parity is, is around nuclear forces, and that's because there's an arms control agreement, the new START arms control agreement in place. Um, what does it, what did this mean for research and development? Well, um, according to Boris Johnson, um, 
there was an aspiration for, for global Britain, post-Brexit Britain, to be a science superpower. And the UK's total R&D spending was acknowledged to be well below the average for um, the EU and the OECD group of industrialized nations. So it, it planned major rises in government R&D, but a key focus of this was military technology linked to a range of um, military industrial strategies. Um, in the energy realm, um, there's a graph in the corner you can see which compares the levels, of the proportion of government spending on energy R&D in 2021. You can see nuclear is four times the level of renewables and, and twice the level of energy efficiency. So you can see the distortion, the bias towards um, military friendly technologies in, in that spending priorities. Meanwhile, um, cuts in, in R&D programs that help tackle poverty, the ones supported by um, the Department for International Development, as it was, that was reformed and uh, um, merged and abolished, um, another change. And then you've got um, a new research and development agency, ARIA, being founded um, outside the mainstream structures and cutting red tape, so they say, and lower regulation in general for emerging technologies being, being pushed through again in the post-Brexit world. So now we come to the, um, after the invasion, after Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And um, we have the war continuing with no end in sight, um, despite what some claim, I, I think there, there's no likely end in sight at the moment. Um, we have a, a prime minister, at least prime minister Liz Truss at the time of writing, um, planning a massive rise in military spending to 3% of GDP from the current 2.2% level. Um, and this is a, an absolutely enormous rise. Um, there's been policy analysis published which says this, this would represent a spending increase of 60% above inflation, largest rise for 70 years since the Korean War, huge increase in, in troop numbers, a military industrial base to pay for it. It would require income tax to rise from 20 to 25% or massive cuts to public services, utterly enormous. Um, and then uh, against this, you've got nuclear war risk growing and the prospect of US nuclear weapons coming back to nuclear uh, to UK shores and military carbon emissions growing um, as well, as far as we can tell from the very perfect data that's out there. And so, um, yeah, I, my perspective um, that I'm presenting here is, is that military incre spending increases will not help improve security. We've seen the the already the NATO, NATO force superiority, even if you just look at it in stark force terms, um, is, is not, it is already more than enough to deal with, with any concerns. And if you take a different, more peace orientated approach, well, we, we, we would not need um, those levels at all either. Um, climate and policy changes, um, as Andrew hinted at the beginning, um, 2022 is another year of climate extremes and disasters. The Ukraine war has, has um, pushed up fossil gas prices, um, but the energy policy changes within the UK um, have shifted towards energy security. And you've got first Boris Johnson and then um, the Liz Trust. You've got the, the, the push for more nuclear, um, for more North Sea oil and gas, for, for the return of fracking, uh, uh, changing views on windfall taxes, but, but never anything particularly serious on that. You've got energy bill support even for the wealthy, but meanwhile things like home energy conservation programs are tiny, behaviour change is, is off the agenda completely, so that really the 1.5 degree climate goal will exist in name only. Um, and Again, my conclusion uh, this is, is that doubling down on fossil fuels and nuclear will not be sufficient to tackle the, the problems that we need to tackle. Uh, and then on social justice, you've got again the Ukraine war leading to spiralling energy costs and the cost of living prices very present in the news at the moment. If you look at the figures around fuel poverty in the UK now, it's 7 million UK households. That's that's approaching one in three UK households, and that's rising. So even stronger arguments for a massive home energy conservation programme 
Um, and then if you look globally, um, just one statistic that I, I found particularly striking from the World Food Programme is that 345 million people now are in acute food insecurity, which is one step away from famine. That's a 150% increase since the, the start of the pandemic. And that's where, when, when um, governments tell you that we have to cut aid because we can't afford it anymore, I think that, that just flies in the face of, of any sane option around tackling poverty and helping those, those in need. And then you've got um, the promise of, of more more cuts in, in public services, benefits, possibly pensions, although that may be changing with what was in the news today. But the black hole in, in government finances at the moment, um, according to some analysis, is, is somewhere around 50 to 80 percent of the core military budget. That's at the moment. Um, and so, you know, it, it's just the, the idea of increasing military spending against that background is, is, is madness. Um, and as I say at the bottom, cutting the help for the poorest will can cause even more suffering. So to conclude, a few recommendations here, trying to draw some of these strands together. If we prioritized helping the highest numbers of, of people in poverty, we would be in the UK, we would be um, prioritizing a massive home energy conservation program. Um, we would be protecting aid budgets and benefits. And we would be focused on curbing energy use by the wealthy to um, bring down energy prices, to reduce demand and bring down energy prices that way. And we'd be pushing for a, a rapid end, a negotiated end to the Ukraine war to help bring down international energy prices. If we prioritise dealing with the existential risk to civilization, so the risk of nuclear war, the risk of, of catastrophic climate change, again, we were prioritising a negotiated rapid end to the, the UK war, uh, to the Ukraine war, and, um, and public spending focused on, on tackling a rapid reduction in carbon emissions of the wealthiest rather than speculative militarised technologies like nuclear or, or um, aviation fuels. And if we prioritise social justice, socially useful work, um, we'd be looking at just transition from the fossil fuel and arms sectors to the energy energy conservation, renewable energy and energy storage sectors. And that's where scientists, engineers, R&D spending and wider government policy should be focused. So I will stop there. Thank you so much, Stuart. That was a whirlwind tour, as indeed the whole afternoon is going to be. But just to remind people that we're giving a bit of